Hi, I'm Mike, and welcome to The Ranch, where today we're gonna to be taking a look at our feedlot program and how beef gets from the ranch to your table. It's coming up today on our Wyoming Life. Hi guys, welcome and thanks for joining us once again as we continue to explore the ranch life and escape the ordinary. Make sure that you subscribe, hit the little bell button so you get notifications when new videos come out every Tuesday, Thursday, and on Sunday here on Our Wyoming Life. So today we're taking a look at our feedlot operation. This is Blonde Cow, by the way. She, uh, she wants some food this morning. Uh, we are taking a look at our feedlot operation and basically back in about 2000, I wanna say 2000, 13, maybe somewhere in there, we decided at one point that we wanted to be able to take beef to farmer's market. Now we had always taken vegetables and stuff like that, but this was a big step for us. Even though we had a beef cattle ranch, uh, Gilbert, my father-in-law had never actually sold beef from the ranch. We were a cow calf operation. We sold calves at auction and that put us at a little bit of a disadvantage. See, the bad thing about being a cattle rancher, especially when you're locked in to the auction system, is that you don't have a whole lot of say over what your product is worth. You go to auction and somebody else tells you what your time and your calves are worth. And for me, coming from corporate America and landing here in 2008 and trying to put my put my brain around this whole thing, it really didn't make a whole lot of sense. It was very frustrating because just like most things, you're, you're locked into the market and you have no control. So in 2015, uh, we decided that we we're gonna try something totally new for the ranch and that was offer our own beef at farmer's market. I think we started that year with keeping back six steers um, from the herd that we didn't sell at auction and that we kept here. And we learned how to feed them out, um, how to fatten them, how to create marbling, and, and how to get them slaughtered and packaged correctly so that we could sell them directly uh, to our customers. It was a little bit of a learning curve. I remember getting back our very first package of beef from the processor, and Aaron, was gonna cook a hamburger. She said, I'm gonna try this, I'm gonna see how it turns out. So she said, I'm gonna cook a hamburger. And she cooked it and there was no fat to it. Um, it was it was a little weird and, and both of us looked at this hamburger and we were like, where is the fat? Because I grew up eating hamburger helper, right? And when you cooked hamburger, it, you had to pour fat off of it. And this wasn't like that. This was very, very lean meat. And honestly, I thought we'd done something wrong. Turns out, we'd done something right. Turns out though, that creating food on the ranch, aside from just taking calves and selling them at auction, is a little bit difficult. And uh, there was quite a few little things we had to learn along the way. And to be totally honest, we're still learning. Even though we've grown now from those six steers that we originally kept back that very first year, and now we finish over 30 steers per year on the ranch and sold directly to the end consumer, um, there's still lots of little things that we learn along the way. And today you get to come along with me as we work with some cows. We're gonna move some steers around and we're gonna try to make it as simple as possible. these steers over here that are in this pasture to a different pasture, we're also going to take a look at our feedlot program and how we feed our cows while they're in our finishing 
program, which is actually the last 60 to 90 days that they're here on the ranch and we give them um, corn, oats, and barley, and all that kind of good stuff, and that's what produces that marbling that we really do like. So we're gonna take a look at that, but first, we've gotta move um, some steers off of this pasture onto a new and greener pasture for them to spend the next couple weeks. I'm a big fan of having any animal that I can uh, be food motivated. Works well for me. Um, so I use cake quite a bit to be able to move cows from here to there. And it makes my life a lot easier, especially when I'm out doing it by myself. A lot of times all I really have to do is get a cow's attention. If I've got cake in the back of the gator, um, they'll pretty much just follow me wherever they need to go. And of course, today we're putting them into a trailer and we're actually taking them across the road over to some uh, some better pasture than what we have them on now. The drought has really uh, kind of knocked the crap out of pretty much all of our pastures, but what we have is a, uh, a situation where we have to get them out of here because even though I'm looking for hay, I haven't found any for sure yet. I've got a couple leads going on um, to where I can bring some stuff in. But if I can't find it uh, pretty soon, we're gonna end up, we're gonna be in trouble. So um, we're trying not to panic, but uh, we definitely wanna make sure that, that we've got these guys taken care of. So we've got three um, steers here left that, uh, not all steers, this one's a heifer. Um, there is one steer up there on the hill that we wanna get moved into the corrals so that we can get them going towards the other pasture and better grass, so. Come on guys, here I got some cake in the back for you. Come here. I'm gonna move up here. See if we can move this steer towards the gator. Get these three moved in, then that is all of the steers that we have out here. So we've got eight more steers that are out here on this pasture, along with our four heifers that are up here. And basically, we want them um, to go before the end of the year. So all of these guys, um, aside from the heifers, of course, will be slaughtered and packaged by the end of the year, finished, slaughtered, packaged, brought back to the farm store and eventually sold to you guys, or whoever decides to come visit us, even if you're not watching. All right, so we've got these guys back here, pretty interested in the cake. We're gonna get them following us. Food is a good thing, very good motivator. Now this is the way to move cows. I'm not a big uh, fan of the giant rodeo and 
pushing and all that kind of good stuff, if I can make things easier for me and for the cows, I'm gonna do it. I don't see uh, what the problem is in that. You know, if you wanna get out and get all rodeo and, and, uh, and that's your thing and you feel like that is uh, what ranching should be, then more power to you. But um, I'm a huge fan of making it as easy as possible on, on all of those who are involved. So we are pulling right here into our little corral get these guys situated. I'm gonna go back here and close this gate. It is a full house back there, um, which is okay because we're not going very far. We're actually just gonna run down here in the home pasture really quick and drop these 13 delinquents off. Um, they are back there rattling and rolling and banging and clanging, and uh, they don't like being in a trailer much. So we wanna get them to some greener grass. Like I said, I don't know when my hay is gonna be here and where they're at now, they would definitely need hay. In fact, we're leaving the horses over there and we're gonna be feeding the horses uh, small squares for the next couple weeks um, so that they've got some food also. It is just pretty much wore down to nothing. And that's the, the one of the most dangerous things about droughts. I mean, obviously um, the big thing is that when it comes to food um, and, and how we plan is we have to stay, we basically have to stay a year ahead of time. So. When we decide how many steers to keep, we decided that last year. And of course, we didn't know there was a drought coming. So we're responsible for these animals. Um, the interesting thing about it is that in 2020, if anybody remembers, um, that's when COVID kicked off. And come about March or April of 2020, we saw a massive influx of people coming and buying local beef. Now, that three months there about just after the toilet paper scare uh, was the uh, was probably the best quarter that we've ever had um, with our local beef sales so we took that information and said okay uh, hopefully next year will be just as good maybe people will uh, you know come to rely on local food a little bit more and and uh, this will be a good thing so we decided to keep back a couple extra steers um, just for that reason. And uh, of course, uh, it didn't really hold true. Uh, a lot of people, obviously, after everything went and calmed down, a lot of people said, oh, you know what? I don't need to go buy local beef because it's back at the grocery store. So um, we kind of got nipped in the butt with that one a little bit. And it's the same story that the big processors have, the major four. Um, they are, they're in the same boat. Uh, we They saw uh, massive influx of beef sales, so they ramped up their production or as much as they could, and uh, and now it's slowed back down. And of course, then the price of meat at the grocery store goes up. That's the difference between us and and uh, the big four and grocery stores and all that kind of good stuff, is that our price didn't go up. We couldn't do that to our customers. So um, our price stayed the same, even though we were incurring a little bit more cost just because we uh, decided to ramp up after COVID and it didn't really pan out for us. But that's okay. That's a life, uh, life lesson, a learning lesson that, that happens. Maybe uh, if we can get this online beef sale thing up and going, uh, we already sell beef jerky online. You can buy that at our website, but we're in the process of actually trying to figure out how to ship beef across the U.S. and do it uh, economically because right now we could, we could do it now. It just costs an arm and a leg to to ship this stuff. So um, if we can figure out how to do it economically and get a rate from UPS or FedEx or whoever we have to deal with um, to get that to happen, then then that'll make our lives a lot a lot easier and you know then we'll have another outlet to be able to sell beef so it's a win-win for us all 
So we're moving these steers and heifers uh, back down here into the home pasture. There's still a little bit of grass down here to eat, and there still is some wet spots. Uh, we do have a natural spring down in here that keeps a lot of this uh, green and, and healthy, and hopefully uh, be able to sustain these guys for at least a couple weeks uh, while we're waiting to get some of our hay in. So there's a small watering hole that's drying up very fast, but that will supply them with some water. Also, we do have some tanks around here that we can fill up if we need to for these guys. So I'm gonna get them as close as I can down here to the water so that they know what's going on, know where the good stuff is. And then all we have to do is let them out. And then we're gonna go talk about how we feed some other steers that are actually in a corral. And those are the steers that we are finishing for uh, for slaughter. So we're gonna take a look at those. We're gonna talk about how we feed them and uh, and how the rest of their life is gonna play out. So let's get these guys out of here and then we'll head back towards the main ranch. You guys ready to go? That it? Hey listen, I know you guys don't care, but you made a mess of my trailer. The trailer was nice and clean. They were in here for eight minutes and destroyed it. Let's head back across the road. We're gonna check in on our steers that we're finishing at this point. These guys are basically hanging out here in limbo. They're gonna live down here for the next couple weeks and uh, make sure they've got enough to eat. But it's really that last 60 to 90 days of their lives where we grain finish them that makes all the difference to us anyway. As we head back, uh, somebody's gonna ask, well, why didn't you hay that nice green spot down there uh, where your spring runs in and leads down to those little tiny dry pot? Number one, the spring isn't really doing a whole lot right now, and that's just because of the drought. It's, uh, it's barely moving. Also, it's a marsh down there, so there is really no, no haying that, but you, know, you, get, uh, you get 10 points for thinking creatively anyway. All right. Let's get back here. We're gonna get these uh, these steers that we're finishing taken care of. So right over here, this is our one ton bag of corn, oats, and barley. It's a pretty even mix, about 50, 50, 50, <laughs> 33, 33, 33%, I guess is what it would be. Um, so, and it's actually uh, created by Dakota Mills, uh, which is our uh, mill over in Belfouche, South Dakota, where we pick up feed and bring it over here. We buy it by the ton. So. This is what it is, and this is what we use to fatten our cattle, or at least our steers. So, I am gonna grab a bucket full of this. Now, we know that a bucket weighs 20 pounds. We have 10 steers that we're finishing right now, and we just started finishing them. We started them at two pounds a piece. So, 10 times two is 20. A 
full bucket and we can take it over to them. So this is, uh, let's see, these guys, these 10 that we have in right now, they're actually due for processing the end of September. So we really do try to give them that 60 to 90 days of grain. Um, and that produces the marbling and the fat that we like to see in our beef. Now, this is not grass-fed beef. Grass-fed beef is a different thing, but all cows eat grass. So there's that. So technically, we market our beef as grass-fed and grain-finished because we believe that everybody deserves to know that all, all cows are grass-fed. Sometimes people tend to forget that. So we are going to head back here and get these guys fed. And we're gonna talk a little bit about their journey and, uh, and where they're gonna go from here. So here's how it works for us and for these steers. So for the next 60 days or so, eh, right in there, these guys will be here in the corrals and they'll be fed regular hay every single day. They've got free access to hay, uh, but each day they receive a ration of corn oats and barley like I just showed you. So we start them out at about two pounds a piece per day. Now it's kind of hard to, to kind of regulate exactly how much each and every cow is getting, but we're gonna guess and we're gonna say that that's pretty close. So each week we ramp that up. So we may raise it one pound one week. We may raise it a pound and a half the next week, just kind of depending on how they're doing. And the best indication of that is looking at their rear ends. If they start to get the runs, um, that means that they've got too much protein going into them and we have to lay off a little bit. So they won't, uh, so they won't get as much for a little while. And then we'll ramp it back up slowly. And basically their systems will get use, used to, uh, to processing the extra protein that they're getting out of the corn, the oats, and the barley. We're also looking for a finish weight of about 1,200 pounds. So that means these guys really have about a couple hundred pounds to put on over the next two months. That's not in undoable. Undoable, is that a word? That's not not doable? That's not doable. No, that's not right. Anyway, it can be done. And basically we're looking for these guys to gain about two to three pounds per day and, uh, and put that weight on. So that won't be a problem at all. Hi, Bria. How are you doing? Bria came to see me. Hey, Bria. Hi. I took away all your friends, didn't I? I'm sorry. It's just you and Hiro over here for a little while, but I'll bring you some food in a bit, okay? Okay. Let me finish this, and then I'll come over and feed you. Okay, so where was I? So 2.2 pounds per day or somewhere in there. Uh, should be able to get them up to that 1,200 pounds pretty easily. Now we're looking at about a 60% yield out of that cow. Um, so a 1,200 pound cow, now we're getting down to our yields. And a 60% hanging weight is actually pretty good. And that's uh, about what we're looking for. So that's 700 pound hanging weight somewhere right in there. So that's our goal. These guys will hang out here for the next 60 days or so. Um, and we've got five going then, and then we've got another five going. And that's one of the biggest things that we've learned as we go here is the fact that we have to pick steers out of our herd to keep. And we don't always wanna pick the biggest and heaviest steers that we have each and every year because we stagger our processing throughout the year. So I know that if I have, if I'm, if I'm sorting calves off, let's say I'm weaning calves in October, and I know that I have a February date for some of these cows and I've got to get them finished quick and I've got to get them up and going. Those are the biggest calves that I have. Those are the ones that I have to move through. So I'm gonna pick the biggest calves right off their moms. But then I may not have another five until June. Well, I don't want a 1400 pound steer going in in June. I'm just putting too much, too much time, too much money into that animal. So basically being able to stagger 
your slaughter dates and uh, being able to pick the right steers out of your herd or, or an auction or wherever you're getting them, that's key because you gotta be able to figure out that two pounds per day is your gain target. Just count yourself backwards. If you have two months, then you've got, what, 30, 60, 120 pounds to play with or something like that. There's math involved, which is not always the best thing in the world. So that's pretty much it for us for today. Um, we are going to get these horses fed. Um, we still have a lot more to do uh, coming up, but we got the steers that we're waiting for processing, that are waiting for to be finished. Those guys are down in a brand new pasture. We're still working on hay. That should be here hopefully within the next couple weeks is what I'm hoping. We'll be able to start giving our first truckloads of hay in. That will help immensely. Cows are still way back on summer pasture. They're getting their 4,000 gallons of water per day. In fact, we just moved them to a new area. We picked up all the tanks and moved them to a whole new area so that the, the cows continue grazing the most efficiently that we can down there. Unfortunately, these steers have grazed this field back behind me out. And that's why we had to move them today. But hopefully uh, this helps you out if you are planning on finishing your own steers. Hopefully this kind of gives you a quick idea, but I would say um, go and research all that you can. Find out everything you can about finishing steers in your area because it could be, could be completely different. If you wanna do grass-fed beef, that's great. You can finish on just grass. It's gonna take a little bit longer depending on where you're at, um, but that's great too. There's a market for grass-fed beef. There's a market for grain-fed, grain-finished beef. There's a market for beef that only eat cranberries, probably. Or if you wanna give them massages and, drink, and feed them beer. That apparently works too. There's all kinds of different ways to do this and we don't look down on anybody who's really just trying to make a living and feed their community with local food. That's the most important part of it all. So thank you very much for coming along with us today. Be sure to subscribe, follow along as we continue to explore the ranch life and escape the ordinary. And we'll be back on Sunday with a brand new weekly vlog. I hope to see you there. Thanks guys, bye.